Welcome back everyone to week 47 uh, here with our weekly update video. Uh, I hope everyone had a better week than I had. Um, not in markets or anything, just spent a lot of time working and pretty much the rest of it reading about repo markets. So that was fun. But hope everyone else did better. Um, so without further ado, let's get into what happened this week. I'm sure most of you heard about this somewhere, but for any who may have missed it, last weekend there was an attack on a Saudi oil field. Now, this shut down 5% of the world's supply, um, and it's still unknown how long it will take to come back and will things escalate further, and will they escalate to a place where for, which further uh, tightens the oil market? We don't know that yet. But um, oil jumped on Monday. Um, it jumped, what was it? depending on the contract, a uh, few percent, 10 percent, 20 percent, depending 5 percent, 8 percent. There's a lot of different oils. Um, but the point is it jumped on Monday and then settled down on Tuesday. And it does not seem like the market is as concerned as it has been in past conflicts. So that remains an issue up in the air. But what was potentially an even bigger event that happened this week, although if you blink or you don't follow certain entities on Twitter, you may have missed it, um, was a repo market um, issue. And now I want to start this by saying I'm not an expert on the repo market. It's not where I spend the majority of my time. But what happened was, from my understanding at least, is with the, the primary dealers of bonds have been uh, not as, not selling as much either voluntarily or not voluntarily. Um, but that's not the, the main issue here. The main issue here is there was a shortness of interbank overnight funding, um, which would seem to indicate both higher demand for U.S. dollars um, than what's available for the purchase of bonds and overnight lending, and not enough, um, so not enough liquidity, too high a dollar, and there's probably also some fear about the ability of the entities to over, to repay. Now, remember, you're just lending overnight in this market, and that if if there's a premium of like four, five, six percent um, lending with another bank versus the Fed, there's probably some fear that you might not be paid back. So something something's up there, and um, so normally. The banks that can settle overnight with each other at a low, at a higher rate, or the Fed at a lower rate, it normally makes sense to settle with each other. Although, in this case, they obviously did not want to do that, so um, this caused the spread in terms of settle with each other versus settle with the Fed to blow out. I'm sure you could find many better uh, explanations of what happened um, all throughout the internet. But basically, if you want to think about it simply, there wasn't enough money to buy the bonds to make things balance overnight because banks need to balance with each other overnight. Um, so what happened was the Fed stepped in and added an additional pool of money, first 54 billion, then 75 billion, um, is this continuous pool of money that can be drawn from overnight to and returned the next day. So it's not 75, then 150, then 225. It is the same 75 billion. But that 75 billion is another type of, another form of quantitative easing in that it is an expansion of the balance sheet. That's basically what's going on for now. So, gold. 
gold, um, cons well, it's been consolidating around 1500, um, and it has fake broken in both directions uh, in this time. So we'll have to see which side it eventually decides on go, which way it goes. Um, I was hoping that the consolidation would be higher, but you know, it went back here and um, it tested the trend line. We'll have to see if it goes again. Gold likes, well, markets in general like um, shaking the weak hands out. So, um, not saying if you sold your weekend or if you bought your weekend. I'm just saying uh, this market likes to pretend it's doing one thing before it does something else. But um, with that being said, um, it seems that we are on a pace where eventually the 75 billion overnight, because uh, 75 billion repo facility by the Fed, eventually that might not be enough unless the seasonal factors which had exacerbated, exacerbated the problem persist, but we'll have to take that one step at a time and keep watching there. Um, but if it's not enough, um, it seems likely to me that eventually um, there's going to be some more money printing type thing. Now, whether that's QE or some other variant, um, I would think that gold would do not too poorly in that type of scenario. That being said, we're not there yet, but it is looking like there are cracks. Now to 99.9% .9 of the world this week, uranium did nothing. But uranium bulls, I'm sure, will tell you that uranium was up 4% on the week. And anyone else would be say, but wasn't it 25 last week and 25? And yeah. But um, it, it did move up on the week, and we'll have to see if that's because of buying. It does look like um, the price is moving around, so it looks like there's some activity. Um, this is a seasonally strong period for uranium, and take that as you will for uranium, uranium equities, whatever. On Friday, um, there was some uh, buying in the uranium space and the bigger, some of the bigger equities. Now, my thought process is next gen energy became somewhat shorted recently because it was going to be removed from an index, a Canadian index. So on Friday, it was strong. And then the market on close orders came out and it turns out that there was a big imbalance to the buy side. So there was going to be a lot of buying on the close of that name. That burst higher, De uh, Denison burst higher, and it, it basically, um, index games. Um, we'll have to see if there's continuation there. I don't know if there will be. There may be, but anyway, one day is not why I think most of us are buying uranium. That being said, um, the only other thing on uranium that I wanted to point out was there's a lot of talk and question about Cameco wanting to buy a lot in the fourth quarter. And I'm sure they would like to buy a whole lot in the fourth quarter, price dependent. That being said, they don't, I don't think they need to buy as much as some people are saying. I've heard some people, some even some CEOs in the in the industry saying they want to buy, or they need to buy 12 million pounds. Well, okay. Um, if they think that on top of Cigar Lake and Inkai, they still need to buy 12 million pounds, I'm not sure about that. And also, I think it's worth noting that in a pinch, they may be able, in a pinch, by say a pinch, I mean like in a price is shooting up and they there's some liquidity problem in the market, they can't get their uranium. I think they might be able to buy some uranium, or not buy, sorry, borrow some uranium from uh, their the people or the entities that are storing it from them. So there's that. Um, I'm not sure how 
much they would participate in a squeeze type scenario, but they could. So I was kind of surprised about the size, the small size of the move in energy. I thought it would be bigger. I thought it would be overdone, um, but I thought it would be like another $10 at least or something. I'm surprised that it wasn't. Maybe this is talking about um, the oversupply that was in the market or the lack of fear or the certainty that it will uh, all be resolved. Maybe it's also a bit of complacency or the fact that bear markets make bull markets and bull markets make bear markets. And the fact is that we're kind of in a bear market in energy and oil, particularly. Uh, well, not particularly, but energy. And so this is kind of like uh, a breath of fresh air from like drowning um, producers that were struggling in the environment. So instead of heading down a path where production would be cut, discipline would be shown, and the price would recover, this is more time spent wallowing in the ocean, I guess. But at the same time, this could have been the turn, but it's just, I was, we were on a path that I think there was going to be more carnage, and this, at the very least, delays that. So what happened in the past week under, in the economies of the world? Well, data continued to not be good. Um, the dollar funding problem peaked its head again in terms of the repo market. And I just got to say that if this problem persists, it, it indicates a tight supply of dollars, which chokes off the rest, well, the rest of the world, ex-US, well, even in the US, from the growth or from funding to grow their economies. And if there were real US dollar weakening procedures, I'm talking probably beyond Q, QE4 because everyone else is also doing QE and also in the past QEs, it didn't really necessarily always weaken the dollar. But we, if there was some real weak dollar weakening policies, then I think we would begin to see some strong global growth. But until then, any attempt to change momentum is going to be an uphill battle to get to growth. And this is being led by this dollar funding issue. And we'll have to keep an eye on that. Okay, so the three picks of the week, um, three noteworthy things of the week. First, that is not an error code on the top line. That is the Cameco 2022 um, options, which just began trading. Now, I said back in what I believe I called Uranium Week uh, that I thought it might be a bit too soon to, um, to buy the 2021 Cameco calls. I said that at the time. I said... Um, it might be too soon. I still think there's a good chance they're in the money. But here, 2022, it I think it gives this thesis a bit of time to not only turn, but play out a little for the market to get to where, you know, kind of where it needs to go and kind of figure out what's going on. It may be too much time, but it may not be enough time. Like, I don't know. 2022, I've been waiting for these calls to come on for a while. So, yeah, that's the pick of the week. They were trading at $0.80 cents for the $17 calls. We'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, uh, so that's pick one. Pick two, Verde Agritech. Um, again, not core holding. Um, just... Just the big boys, the big producers, not boys, but you know what I mean, uh, have shown that this pricing environment doesn't work. So they want higher prices. This 
is not going to be a negative. I would not, I can't think of a way that this would be a, a negative for, for Verde. Um, and there, again, their price is based on the uh, potassium content in the, in the, in their product versus other products. So as a potassium, potassium price goes up, their prices go up, and they don't need them to, so that's an added boost. Again, the pricing isn't their main question, so that's pick two. Third pick, Scorpio Tankers. Um, it pulled back a little bit with um, the oil attack and oil questions and where's who's going to be shipping who oil. I still think IMO 2021 is making things, or sorry, IMO 2020 is making things a mess for the next year and a bit. Meanwhile, demand is supposed to grow. Uh, so once this, once this Saudi issue is resolved or digested into the markets, I think that tanker or shipping stocks will re-find the trajectory that they had before that. Again, just a short pullback here, could be nothing. Um, dry bulk rates did come off a little bit, so that's pretty much as expected. Uh, we'll have to see where that goes. So that's the picks of the week. That's it for today, everyone. Hope you enjoyed, found something interesting, have a talking point or a new idea. And with that, I will wish you luck until we meet again. As always, everyone, please do your own research before making any investment decisions. The uh, This channel shall not be liable for any losses incurred from investment decisions made as a result of information obtained on this channel. Um, good luck with your investments. I'll catch you next time.